provided to us in 1972. Do you remember the names? Singer and Nicholson. The model's name is Fluid Mosaic Model and it was proposed in 1972. Alright? Understood that? So let's start our discussion from here. So it is cell membrane or plasma membrane. It is absolute requirement for all living organisms and it decides the substances entering the cell. That's how it becomes the most integral part of the cell. Now, the chemical nature of the membrane was determined by studies on human RBC, but the detailed structure was only observed under the electron microscope in 1950s, all right? On the basis of chemical studies, it was found that cell membrane consists of lipid bilayer, okay? Do remember, this is very important. It consists of lipid bilayer with polar heads towards outside and non-polar tail towards inside. Now, if we have to talk about what kind of, you know, lipid would make up the plasma membrane, our plasma membrane is made up of phospholipid bilayer, okay? And this is a phospholipid. You can see a structure here, a circle followed by a string-like structure. This circular thing is the head. This is the head followed by the string-like tail, okay? And this entire thing is called the phospholipid, all right? Now see, the head is going to be polar. That means it is going to be water-loving or water-attracting, okay? Hydrophilic in nature. Whereas the tail is going to be hydrophobic or water repelling in nature. Two of the very opposite characters together exist in phospholipid. That's why we also call phospholipid to be amphipathic in nature. Okay? Amphipathic in nature. Understood? So polar heads towards outside and non-polar tails towards inside. Alright? And see, it's a bilayer after all, isn't it? Two phospholipid bilayers will be present. So this is one phospholipid bilayer. Okay? This is one. And this is another. Alright? And see how they are arranged. First, they, the, first there will be the polar heads, then tail. And for the other one, there again next remains a tail layer. Finally, followed by a polar head. That means it is forming three distinct layers. One layer of head, followed by one distinct layer of thick layer of tail. Then comes another layer of head. So that's why we also call plasma membrane to be a trilamellar membrane. Okay, trilamellar membrane. One polar head membrane, like you no know, layer, then coming the like you know wide uh, you know tail layer and then finally we have a, a layer of polar heads again so three distinct layers are there polar non-polar polar so we call it a trilamellar membrane as well do remember this all right now polar heads are hydrophilic that means water loving whereas non-polar tails are hydrophobic water repelling okay now Later, it was also revealed that cell membrane also consists of proteins and carbohydrates. Apart from phospholipid bilayer, our plasma membrane also consists of proteins and carbohydrates, which remains embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. The ratio of protein and carbohydrate, it is not fixed. It varies from cell to cell. For example, human RBC consists of 52% of protein and 40% of lipid. All right. Now, this membrane proteins are of two types based on ease of extraction. Basically, in this phospholipid bilayer, you can see in this structure, in this diagram, you can see two types of things are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer, right? Some are blue towards outside and some are red towards inside, okay? So, this blue and red structures, these are actually the proteins that are associated with the plasma membrane. Those proteins which are towards outside, they are called extrinsic proteins and they can be easily removed from the membrane, okay? So they have a ease of extraction. But these red colored ones, they are called intrinsic proteins because they are located or they are embedded either fully, totally or partially inside the plasma membrane. Hence, we call them 
intrinsic proteins they are internally embedded in the membrane and they are not very easy to remove from the membrane it's not very easy to extract them from the membrane that's why we have extrinsic proteins towards outside intrinsic protein towards inside all right now see intrinsic or integral proteins they are buried totally or partially into the membrane the integral protein which runs throughout the membrane are called tunnel or transmembrane protein now see among this inti integral or intrinsic proteins you can see a few are much longer isn't it they are as if running throughout the membrane they are starting from one end and running up till the next end isn't it covering the whole membrane so these are called tunnel protein or trans transmembrane protein and this proteins they are finally going to form tunnels within the plasma membrane allowing water transport to occur so that means water transport throughout the membrane won't be occurring automatically because the integral the inside part of the plasma membrane is after all hydrophobic water repelling in nature isn't it the inside part of the plasma membrane consists of hydrophobic tails and that will not allow water to move through the membrane rather it will repel water so that's why it is the tunnel protein which will form some channels or tunnels throughout the membrane and that's when or that's how by the help of this proteins okay the water will be able to be transported inside or moving out of the cell so this is what was mostly Uh, you know suggested upon by fluid mosaic model before this whatever models were you know put forward for the plasma membrane no one could explain water transport across the plasma membrane the membrane being lipid based they could not explain water transport so fluid mosaic model was the first one to validate that how water exactly will be moving across the plasma membrane and that's why it is the most well accepted model so far all right so see this uh next coming to extrinsic or peripheral proteins they lie on the surface of the membrane and can be easily extracted from the membrane okay they lie towards surface on the surface means towards the outside see here the blue colored ones they are the extrinsic proteins they can be easily removed by certain chemical treatments hence we call them uh, we categorize them separately or we call them the extrinsic proteins all right now this improved structure of membrane has been described as protein icebergs floating in the sea of phospholipids now this particular model or this diagram isn't it looking as if phospholipid is a huge sea and in that sea these proteins are floating just like icebergs all right now this model is hence known as fluid mosaic model and it is proposed by singer and nicholson in 1972 do you remember that it's very very important all right now according to this model the quasi fluid nature of lipids enables lateral movement of protein within the overall bilayer the proteins can be moving within this bilayer and this ability of the proteins to move within the bilayer would be known as fluidity would be called as fluidity okay that's how our plasma membrane is fluid in nature all right and we call the model to be fluid mosaic model all right understood that so let me tell you the whole model once again in brief fluid mosaic model is the most well accepted model of plasma membrane explaining the structure of plasma membrane which was proposed by singer and nicholson in 1972 according to fluid mosaic model our plasma membrane is a phospholipid is made up of phospholipid bilayer which are arranged in a trilamellar fashion okay that means first there will be polar head layer then two layers of hydrophobic tail again another layer of hydrophilic head okay hydrophilic or polar head a layer of hydrophobic or non polar tail another layer of polar or hydrophilic head that's why we call that we say that according to fluid mosaic model our plasma membrane is made up of phospholipid bilayer and it is arranged in trilamellar fashion in this particular uh, you know phospholipid bilayer there would be various types of proteins which will remain embedded 
Some proteins will be towards periphery, we call them extrinsic proteins, they can be easily removed from the membrane and some proteins will be deep, deeply embedded into the membrane and cannot be easily extracted from the membrane and we call them intrinsic proteins, alright. Apart from that, also carbohydrates in various proportions will be found in the plasma membrane. Alright, so this is all about the fluid mosaic model. Fine. Now let us see the functions of the plasma membrane. There are so many functions actually. The basis, uh, you know, the very, very survival of the cell itself depends on the cell membrane. So see, it allows cell growth, formation of intercellular junctions, cell division, secretion, endocytosis, etc. Endocytosis means cell inside the cell, the plasma membrane sometimes. See, suppose this is a cell, okay? And something large, very large, wants to enter the cell. So, of course, if that large substance try to, tries to pass through the plasma membrane, will it be able to allow the transport? Because the substance is so large, it is not possible that the large substance can easily pass through the plasma membrane. No. Rather, if it tries to do so, the membrane would rupture. So, at that time, what will happen, you see? The plasma membrane simply will undergo a invagination. That means it will undergo an infolding. And in that infolding, this large substance which was coming towards the cell, that will fall in that, okay, that will fall in that infolding. Now, because the plasma membrane is anyways fluid in nature, so it will seal off, it will close itself, okay, forming a vesicle inside the cell. Alright, now simply this vesicle that contains the large substance now will be pinched off from the plasma membrane and hence successfully this large macromolecule could enter inside the cell without rupturing the membrane, isn't it? So this would be known as endocytosis, alright? So membrane is going to allow, uh, you know, formation of intercellular junction that means to maintain a cell to cell communication, cell division which we will learn in the next chapter in details secretions, various types of secretions means substances which will be formed inside the cell, they can be, uh, you know, easily given out of the cell due to the membrane's fluidity or membrane's permeability and of course endocytosis, engulfing of larger substances or macromolecules inside the cell without rupturing the cell, alright? Now, it also allows transport, now that's very important. Plasma membrane allows transport as it is selectively permeable to some molecules present on either side of it. So there are mainly two types of transport. So see, mainly in the plasma membrane two types of transport can be observed. One is exactly opposite the other. So in that case it would be very easy for you to remember. First we are going to talk about passive transport and then active transport. Passive transport is something where substances move from higher to lower concentration, okay? Anything in nature has a tendency to move from higher to lower concentration until and unless or until an equilibrium is reached, alright? So in that case, passive transport is exactly that. It is occurring where the substances would be moving naturally as per their natural tendency from higher to lower concentration and hence in such kind of transport no energy would be required okay energy investment is not required so we call such kind of transport to be downhill transport just like while you're coming uh, you know downhill when while you're coming uh, you know uh, downstairs or you're coming downhill you don't have to be uh, using a lot of energy of yours rather it would be happening naturally isn't it so similar way here also passive transport where substances would be moving according to a concentration gradient and no energy is required to be invested we will call it downhill transport as well one of the most important example or types of passive transport you can say would be simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion simple diffusion means suppose across the plasma membrane uh, lipid based substances okay lipid based substances which uh, are themselves hydrophobic in nature they can easily pass through the plasma membrane without taking the help of any membrane proteins okay or any carrier proteins 
these proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane they also help in transport and hence we call them carrier proteins as they are carrying the substances in and out of the cell. But if lipid based substances has to pass through the plasma membrane they don't require any membrane protein. They can easily pass through the plasma membrane anyways alright and we call those kind of you know lipid based transports happening from higher to lower concentration to be simple diffusion alright. But in case of water, water you know very well the plasma membrane's interior is hydrophobic or water repelling. Of course water cannot be passing through the plasma membrane directly then. It would have to take the help of some tunnel proteins or carrier proteins for its transport. But of course it would also be moving from higher to lower concentration. Okay, Higher to lower concentration water is moving. So that means energy is not required. But then it is requiring some membrane protein. Its, its movement has to be helped out by some membrane protein. Only then it can pass through the plasma membrane. So this is called facilitated diffusion. So both simple diffusion for lipid based substances or facilitated diffusion for water based substances would be falling under passive transport. Okay, here in both the simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, one thing remains common that both are happening from higher to lower concentration and both would not require any energy. Okay, the difference being simple diffusion would not take the help of any membrane protein. Facilitated diffusion is being facilitated because it is taking the help of some membrane protein. That's the difference. Alright. Now, moving to the second type of, uh, you know, uh, transport across plasma membrane that is active transport. In active transport here substances move from lower to higher concentration. As I have told you one is exactly the opposite of other. So active transport here substances move from lower to higher concentration. That means exactly uh, you know against the concentration gradient. So because here substances are moving against their natural tendency hence energy is required to be invested. And energy that is being invested in this process would be ATP. ATP is the energy currency of the cell after all. So of course if the energy uh, uh, you know is required in active transport it would be in the form of ATP. So ATP will be absolutely required for active transport to occur and hence we call active transport to be uphill transport. Just like while you are climbing up a hill, you would require a lot of energy to be invested, isn't it? Likewise, active transport is hence known as uphill transport. For example, sodium potassium pump in animal cells. So, that's all regarding plasma membrane or cell membrane. I hope all of you have understood the structure of the plasma membrane as explained under fluid mosaic model and you have also understood the functions of plasma membrane in details. So with that uh, we complete the class here itself, in the next class we will start with cell organelles.